professor at Queen's University in Canada. I also uh, hold a, a Canada Research Chair uh, position in innovative and retrofitted uh, uh, structures. And uh, I will be, in fact, talking about two presentations uh, today. Uh, if I can just put this to the uh, slideshow and uh, minimize some of the windows here. Uh, the, the first presentation uh, uh, is, uh, both presentations have to do with uh, pre-stressed concrete. The first one has to do with uh, pre-stressed concrete filled fiber reinforced polymer tubes or FRP tubes uh, for uh, a variety of applications including piles, poles, uh, or uh, overhead science, traffic sign structures and a variety of applications in fact. It's quite a versatile system. And this work uh, was done by myself and several uh, of my graduate students over the past uh, perhaps uh, uh, 10 to uh, 13 years. So if we uh, look at the system, the idea here is to try to use uh, a FRP tube or fiber reinforced polymer tube. And these are uh, uh, essentially what people may call casually fiberglass tubes. Uh, they are uh, structural components and currently available for a variety of applications, uh, including uh, the pipeline industry. So we, we are not necessarily custom making these tubes. They already exist, but we started thinking of a, uh, a clever way uh, to use them in a different application, in, the case, in this case in precast or cast in place concrete. So we take these tubes and we fill it with concrete, um, and then we have a, a what we call a concrete filled FRP tube or C, uh, in short CFFT as you can see in this picture. These tubes made of fiberglass uh, uh, sort of uh, saturated with resins like epoxy or other type of polymers. Um, and, they, uh, and, and the tube is quite light in weight and is uh, certainly non-corrosive. So it has a variety of uh, advantages that I'll speak about shortly. Uh, the system, this concrete field tube, uh, can be used uh, as primarily flexural members, uh, like you see in the top right pictures, uh, where you can see it can be used for fender piles or certain piles subjected to lateral loading, or uh, 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 utility poles at the bottom here, or light poles or overhead sign structures. All these are flexural applications, or could be used as a pier or a column or pile for a bridge which is primarily axial compression uh, member. Um, these are some of the applications uh, we have had with this kind of concrete field tube systems. You know, there have been several thousands of these piles installed along the east and west coasts of the United States. Uh, here you can see some of these in the fender piling uh, applications in marine environments, which are quite aggressive in terms of the durability uh, requirements. This is a picture of the first bridge we built using this technology. Uh, uh, in, that's the Route 40 bridge in Virginia. You can see here uh, the piles uh, uh, extending above the ground level, level up to the superstructure. And these are concrete filled tubes up till, I believe, uh, 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 maybe 600 millimeter diameter or more, slightly more. And uh, these are uh, fiberglass tubes filled with concrete without any steel reinforcement at all. So the, the, the tube, or if we look at the FRP tube, what is the point? Uh, it is a non-corrosive uh, stay-in-place, what we call stay-in-place or permanent formwork. Uh, the tube protects the concrete and any in, in internal reinforcements you might choose to put inside from any aggressive external environments because the tube is impermeable and it almost protects the concrete inside from the uh, de-icing salt spray in highways uh, or any splash zone uh, where uh, 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 problem with moisture getting inside the concrete or uh, and causing other problems like free flow damage and things like that. The tube itself is a has several layers of fibers oriented at different directions dire <coughs> directions, so it's a multi-directional reinforcement, and that can replace uh, uh, completely or partially the internal steel reinforcement in the axial and the hoop directions. In terms of pile application, the uh, tube can be produced with a roughened outer surface, so that roughness in the outer surface is very good 
in terms of creating skin friction or uplift resistance in case of piles. Another advantage, if we look at the tube and the, 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 the picture on the right here, uh, you see that the uh, concrete is in completely inside the section versus conventional piles or construction where you see the concrete cover is quite significant. Uh, and if you look at the confined zone, which is the green, shaded, uh, colored in green, in this case here, it's actually uh, uh, significantly smaller than if you uh, have the entire concrete confined at the extreme surface by the tube. As it turned out for typical applications at Ultimate, for example, in pure bending, that concrete cover, in the case of conventional construction, which is completely vulnerable to spoiling and is indeed unconfined, is actually quite significant part of the compression zone, almost 40% of the compression zone size. Whereas if you have a tube at the outer surface here, you, you can account for all this concrete as confined concrete. So some of the uh, work we have done in the past, and I mentioned the bridge in Virginia. In fact, the diameter for that bridge, uh, bridge column uh, or bridge pile was 24.6 inch. As you can see here, that's the blue curve. And this is the moment curvature uh, response of that particular pile in pure bending in this case. Uh, you see the moment curvature response for that pile. And then uh, some of the conventional piles used in Virginia, uh, the V-dot uh, uh, use the uh, 20, very common, the square 20 inch by 20 inch uh, pre-stressed uh, uh, concrete pile. So you can, as you can see here, uh, pre-stressed by 14 half inch strands, the and that's the moment curvature uh, response for this. You can see that we are able to match the same capacity, and the, the, the ultimate moment capacity is certainly matched using this system. But we, what we found is that the stiffness, we are, at this point, we are unable to compete with the stiffness uh, because of a number of reasons that I will speak about. Uh, the most obvious one is that the pre-stressed pile is pre-stressed, meaning cracking will ha happen at a much uh, higher load. That means you have the uncracked stiffness. stiffness. Um, so the, the problem now, which is the motivation behind this project, is that how can we improve this kind of stiffness for the concrete filled tubes? Some of the reasons for uh, the low stiffness is that the fiberglass or glass fibers, reinforced polymer, inherently have low stiffness. So if steel is, uh, has a Young's modulus of 200 GPA, then the fiberglass parallel to the fibers have only 40 GPA. So it's about 20, so on its own is 20% of the modulus of uh, steel. If you add to that the fact that in a tube you have layers at different directions, orientation, and things like that, so the collective final uh, uh, overall modulus is even less than that 40 GPA. So that is a important reason for the lower modulus uh, or enhanced lower stiffness of uh, uh, GFRP or fiberglass uh, tubes filled with concrete. So we started thinking about two directions. Uh, one way was to, uh, by pre-stressing this system. If we pre-stress this system, the concrete filled tube, we can enhance serviceability, and we can also mobilize uh, the confinement effect. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, 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 if we uh, uh, pre-stress the concrete, put it under compression, we will be able to acti activate a confinement mechanism that is quite significant, and that will be very beneficial for the concrete. As concrete gets confi confined, its axial capacity uh, gets uh, certainly increased. Uh, so the objective of this study was to improve fle flexural performance of CFFTs, concrete field FRP tubes, uh, compare the behavior of uh, pre-stressed uh, concrete field tubes with regular uh, conventional uh, pre-stressed concrete members with just spiral, steel spirals, uh, and pre-stressing, and uh, to study the effects of a, a number of things on the behavior, including the pre-stress level, the thickness of the tube, and the number of st uh, strands, the pre-stressing method, pre-tensioned versus post-tensioned, uh, and also to do some uh, low cycle uh, eff uh, effect, loading and unloading, and the, see the effect on stiffness, and also to study the failure mode, uh, what kind of failure will happen in this kind of different hybrid system. And at the end, we wanted to develop a model that can uh, uh, predict the complete response of beams and beam column system uh, 
uh, for this kind of concrete field tubes. I must say that given the advantage of the tube in, in enhancing durability of the system, uh, it will be perfectly fine to use uh, pre-stressing steel strands. So, and that's what we did. And the argument here is that the steel strands inside the concrete uh, will last longer, hopefully, uh, because the concrete is encapsulated by the FRP tubes. So there is a, a very little chance of uh, intru uh, intrusion of moisture into the system, and hence the steel strands uh, are quite uh, uh, will, will, will be in the, the durability of this system will be enhanced. So it's really a hybrid system of a fiberglass tube, concrete core, pre-stressed with steel strands, and we will soon see the benefits of the tube to the system. So the experimental work we did was uh, uh, studying uh, tubes which are, I believe, uh, 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 13 inch, 13 and a half inch diameter, uh, 322 to 324 millimeter diameter, and the thickness 4.5 to 5.3 millimeters. Again, uh, I'm using the metric units. Uh, uh, excuse me if this perhaps may, may not be quite convenient for some of the uh, 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 listeners, but uh, I'm using the metric in this particular case. So the parameters we looked at, the uh, level of pre-stress, so we looked into jacking stress of 31% to 78% of the FPU, and that's the 270 KSI steel, or 1860 MPA pre-stressing steel, so that's the level of pre-stress. The number of uh, uh, strands, 4 and 8, pre we looked into pre-tension and also unbonded post-tension, and also we looked into the uh, tube composition. So the tube itself, fiberglass tube, as I said, we can control the ratio of fibers in X and Y directions. Many products are available. And that's a huge advantage of this kind of tubes versus steel tubes. In a steel tube, it's uh, isotropic, homogeneous. You have the same properties in X and Y direction. Uh, in this case, one can actually engineer the tube to control the ratio of fibers and hence strength and stiffness in y and x directions as desired. We looked into 1.7 to 1, 1.5 to 1, and 1 to 1.5. These are the ratio or the content volume of fibers in x and y direction for the same thickness. So the first specimen was a control, conventional control uh, pile uh, uh, with a steel spiral reinforcement uh, uh, at a pitch of 80 millimeters center to center and had eight strands, uh, a half inch and the effective pre-stress in concrete was 12.4 MPa after uh, all losses. And the second type, uh, the second specimens were PCFF, and we call the first one PCSS, second one is PCFFT1 and 2. Those had the same tube, uh, which had 1.7 uh, in the longitudinal direction uh, to ratio to 1 in the hoop direction. So it's heavier in the longitudinal direction than the hoop direction in terms of the fibers, and it also had eight strands. So the difference was the pre-stress level uh, uh, that produced 11 MPa in the first and, uh, and, and half of that, 50% of that, which is 4.8 MPa uh, comp effective compressive stress in the second. So that is the effect of pre-stress level. Third one has a different tube, which is 1.5 to 1, and it had eight strands also, and had an effective uh, here it is, pre-stress of 10.8 MPa. The fourth and fifth ones uh, uh, had uh, uh, opposite tubes, meaning 1 to 1.5. That means these tubes were heavier in the hoop direction than the axial direction. Um, and then the, we had four strands, half an inch uh, strands. So it's less pre-stress in this case. Um, and the same effective pre-stress was, in both of them was, 5.8 MPa, 5.8 MPa. The difference is one is bonded pretensioned, and the other is unbonded post-tensioned. Everything else is the same, except one is bonded, one is pretensioned, and the other is post-tensioned, unbonded, ungrouted. Now, let's have a look at the properties of the tube itself. So the tubes, we did coupons, and there is a, uh, we cut coupons from the tube in the longitudinal and the hoop direction, and we test them in tension. Uh, without getting into much detail of that, I can show you the stress strain curve. You can see here the stress strain curve of the tube. Um, uh, the, the blue one is premature failure. If you have a very long tube, remember these 
fibers are not perfectly in the longitudinal direction. They are oriented at small angles. In the, it, it's not perfectly 0, 90 or not perfectly circumferential or axial. They have a small angle with the hoop and the axial. So if you have a very long sample, you have some of the, this, there is a discontinuity effect at the side of the sample, of the coupon. So some fibers are discontinuous, which makes the tube appear weaker than really it is. Because in, in reality, the tube is quite continuous. The fibers are continuous. Uh, so if you have a very long coupon, it appears weaker. But the fact of the matter is that so the tube is have con all continuous fibers. So when we did a short coupon, we were able to get the full potential capacity of the tube. And that's a longitudinal stress strain curve for a sample for one of the tubes. It reached 300 MPM. 300 MPM. And then fails by tension. In terms of fabrication, we wanted to simulate the exact conditions of production. So we went to a precast plant. And you can see here, uh, this is the pre-tension process. Uh, what we have done, and I think the mouse is uh, not working here. Here it is. Uh, this is the abutments in a pre-conventional precast plant. So we put the strands, and then we have our uh, fiberglass tube, and this is the bulkheads at the end. Um, uh, and then we have a small axis hole. I, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, we have small axis hole uh, uh, to be able to pump concrete. So the key here is that concrete will be delivered into the tube by pumping. That is the easiest and perhaps maybe the only way or the easiest way you can get the concrete in to in make sure that it's completely filling the tube. And that's the case here. You can see the pump uh, uh, inside, and you can see the axis hole from one end. From the bulkhead, we pump concrete, and we have hole at the other end. And you fill it, and once concrete starts coming from the other end, we know that we have uh, pressurized the, the, the tube has been filled with concrete. Uh, and, uh, and we use a perhaps a, a, a expensive additive or a low, uh, uh, maybe a low shrinkage uh, 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 additive or cement. For the post tension, uh, we fabricated the tube with small ducts inside, uh, and we inserted the strands. As you can see here, we anchor the dead ends, and then we start post tensioning from the end. Uh, uh, again, is the space itself, and then we anchor, uh, as you can see. Now, in terms of test setup, uh, we can see here that this is the, uh, the spacement tested in flexure, because this is a flexural study, uh, a span of 3.6 meters, uh, that's 12 feet, and a constant moment zone of half a meter, and heavily instrumented for slip and uh, for strain gauges and for uh, uh, strains in the circumferential axial and, uh, and uh, deflections as well. And that is the test uh, setup uh, for one of the spacements, happened to be in this case the post tension one, as you can see. So in terms of results, this is the specimen showing. Uh, the whole point of pre-stressing was to improve stiffness. So the first thing we wanted to do is that we compare the pre-stressed one uh, concrete field tube to another concrete field tube that is uh, non-pre-stressed from literature, com very comparable to this one. And you see here the moment curvature normalized, normalized the moment to the diameter and concrete strength to make sure it's a fair, fair comparison. Right away, you can see that at any given load, the deflection or curvature is much less. So stiffness definitely improved. Uh, here is the first point here. This is the cracking point. This is the onset beginning of yielding of the steel strands. And that is failure by rupture of the tube in tension. In both cases, it's a tension failure by rupture fracture of the tube uh, on the tension side. Clearly, we gained significantly in terms of stiffness, but also in terms of strength because the steel strands as well contribute to strengths in addition to stiffness. These are actually the two specimens. That the, uh, the, the blue one is the one from literature. Uh, and that's because of the slight difference in diameter. You see the diameter is comparable, comparable but slightly different. And there are certain uh, small differences in terms of the uh, 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 spans and things like that. So we normalize the behavior. Uh, with respect to the diameter and FC prime. The reinforcement ratio of the fibers, which is the thickness to the four times thickness to diameter ratio, that's the area tube over area core or area concrete, is comparable. In fact, the, it's slightly higher from the uh, one from literature, 3.92% versus the red one is a bit lower in reinforcement ratio, which is the pre red one in the current study. But it's as close as we can get to finding tubes comparable. 
This is probably one of the most important findings here, is the conventional uh, pre-stressed pile with steel sp spirals compared to the tubes. Uh, uh, compared to one identical except that it has a tube. Again, we show the uh, normalized behavior here. Uh, you can see that that's the conventional pile. You get first cracking and then new, uh, and then right at this point is very important. This is crushing of the concrete cover. The unconfined concrete cover on top that is in compression zone, the outside the spiral crushes early. But because of the spiral, the core is much longer until the steel strands ruptured actually in, in tension in this case. When you have a tube instead of the spiral, uh, significant gains in terms of uh, st uh, capacity and some stiffness after first cracking. Here you see the first yielding of the steel. Here is the uh, failure of the tube on the compression side and I'll talk about that later. Uh, right away you can see that, that the tube does many things. It contributes longitudinally. So like the strands, uh, so whereas a spiral does not contribute longitudinally. So the tube here is adding the longitudinal effect in addition to uh, confinement in the circumferential direction. So you can see that significant gains here. Um, there was one more thing here that the, uh, oh yeah, the yielding is delayed. So the yielding happens at a higher load as well. And then eventually the failure in this case. I must say something. To make it a, 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 the criteria for design to be able to compare spiral to tube, the, the pitch uh, or spacing or the pitch of the steel spiral uh, was designed such that in the circumferential direction we have the same stiffness as the tube. So the steel in the uh, spiral was designed to give the same circumferential stiffness equivalent to that of the tube, to be as close as we can get to a fair comparison. So clearly, conventional construction is, uh, gives us a limited capacity governed by crushing of the concrete cover, unfortunately, outside the uh, spiral, uh, whereas the tube confines a much larger concrete area than the spiral, as I indicated at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, effect of pre-stress level, this is uh, the only parameter here is the pre-stress level. The red curve has a higher 11 MPA effective pre-stress in concrete versus the blue curve, double that is a blue curve. So, of course, effective pre-stress uh, pre level uh, doesn't affect ultimate much. It affects uh, stiffness after cracking, it affects serviceability. So, of course, cracking happens at a higher load if you have higher pre-stress. Uh, uh, yielding happens, however, at a lower load, but then the stiffness after cracking is higher for the uh, higher pre-stress level. This is expected. Uh, bonded versus unbonded or pretension versus unbonded post-tension, you can, as expected again, no, not, not much difference before cracking, but after cracking there is a big difference. Stiffness is higher if you have a bonded strand, uh, and also the capacity is slightly higher if you have uh, the bonded uh, versus unbonded. That is the only difference in this uh, case. Uh, this is two specimen that effect of total reinforcement index. Reinforcement index, uh, this is the laminate structure of the tube here. We have spacements uh, of uh, different laminates and different thicknesses. So if you add the reinforcement index, meaning uh, uh, normalized reinforcement ratio with respect, normalized with respect to the strength of the material, meaning the pre-stressing steel plus the effect of FRP and the steel collectively, every kind of reinforcement in the system, you find that the red curve here, this one, had 63% so-called reinforcement index versus 38% reinforcement index for the blue curve. Uh, and of course, a higher collective reinforcement, steel plus FRP, resulted in a higher strength and stiffness than the blue curve. So really, both are different in this case here. The tube is different, and the steel strength number is different as well. But we accounted for that through the reinforcement index system or parameter. Here is the failure mode. That is the conventional pile, pre-stressed by axis symmetric by steel strands and spirals. You can see that the concrete cover uh, crushes very early uh, and the concrete core remains confined. Uh, but also you see that the steel strands in compression, the buckle, uh, interesting, uh, in the compression side you can see the buckling of the strands once you lose your concrete cover here. That's very interesting behavior. Uh, and that limits the capacity, obviously, of the system. Whereas the tube fails uh, in a very interesting way. The tube fractures 
uh, bursting, almost like bursting in the hoop direction. But the fact of the matter, this tube is biaxial loading. So you have axial compression and hoop tension. So the combination of axial compression and hoop tension uh, results in that kind of failure of the tube on the compression side. And this happened after yielding of the steel strength. So this kind of uh, failure you see here is for tubes that are with heavy fibers in the longitudinal uh, and less fibers in the circumferential. If you have the other tube, which is less fibers in the uh, longitudinal and heavy in the uh, circumferential in terms of fibers, you rupture that you fibers rupture in the longitudinal direction, as you can see here. So the longitudinal fibers fracture, simply fracture. Uh, the confinement effect of the uh, combined with the tube effect is very interesting. So what we did here is that we are plotting the uh, top longitudinal strain, top longitudinal strain of the tube versus uh, uh, top circumferential strain at the same point. So axial compressive strain versus hoop, uh, hoop tensile strain at the top. Uh, uh, keep in mind that axial compression in general, if this concrete was unconfined, concrete crushes here at 0 0.003. Concrete crushes, unconfined concrete crushes at 0 0.003. So should have been at this point. You can see how much further we have went because of the confinement. Now, uh, the in interesting point is that the turning, there is a sudden change here or there. This is heavy pre-stress level 11 MPA. This is light pre-stress 4.8 MPA. That turning point from one slope to the other, this is the beginning of activation of the confinement mechanism. So the confinement kicks in at this point. To put this in light of a pure bending, uh, and this from literature, pure bending versus pure axial. Of course, the, the pure axial compression is the ultimate case for confinement, the maximum confinement you can get. Uh, in this case, if you can see uh, this boundary, the blue curve here, that means suddenly we have very high hook strains because of confinement, uh, and that's the change in the curve. And this is the blue curve down up there is the pure bending. In pure bending, without any pre-stressing, of course, I'm talking about a concrete field tube without pre-stressing. In pure bending, you have just this one slope. You don't get the second slope. So pre-stressing allows us to make the flexural case as if very close in efficiency to an axial uh, case, meaning the confinement effect is quite significant because of the pre-stressing of concrete that is confined, completely confined in a tube. Now, the, if I take the ratio of the, uh, if I say that the efficiency is the ratio of the slope of the second part to the first part, that's the reflection of the slope, change in slope, that's a reflection of the uh, confinement effectiveness, we can see that this increases as the uh, pre-stress level increase. The higher pre-stress, the more confinement you get. So we also developed analytical model to design and analyze this system. And you can see here the idea is to predict the moment curvature and load deflection and generate the bending moment axial load interactions. And uh, uh, there is a study many effects. Uh, uh, I will talk about it shortly. So these tubes are analytically analyzed using the so-called classical lamination theory. Classical lamination theory. So you have many layers. Each layer has a fiber and normal to the fiber axis uh, and a different angle, theta 1. Each layer has its Young's modulus Poisson's ratio and the, the angle and the, uh, the, that's the input. The output is how we can sort of, if you will, consider a, 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 a smeared effect. The smeared effect is that at the end we want what's the effective Young's modulus and strength in the transverse and hoop direction uh, and axial direction, as you can see here, for analysis purpose. And this is what the classical lamination theory does. As far as the materials, you can see here that the, 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 the material is modified. Uh, the, the this is a prediction of the stress-strain curve of the material using the classical lamination theory. And you see the blue curve is the classical lamination theory prediction for the stress-strain curve. It captures the capacity, but does not necessarily capture the slight nonlinearity of the tube. Uh, for concrete, we use the constitutive relation, the stress-strain curve for concrete in compression. And that's the model by Vicky on, uh, excuse me, the, the Popovics model, 1973. And for tension, we model the concrete accounting for tension stiffening for the using the model by Vicky on Collins, 86 here. For the tube, 
uh, sorry, that, excuse me, again, that's for the concrete as well. The difference is this one on the left is unconfined concrete, but when you confine concrete, that's the green curve, it becomes much stronger as we uh, expect. So that we use the models that I developed with Professor Samir Iskalla uh, back in the late 90s and uh, published in 2001. So this is a confinement model for concrete in compressor that we developed in the past for concrete under compression, pure compression. Uh, for steel, pre-stressing steel, we use the modified ramberg osgood function, and that's a function for the high-stress steel, pre-stressing steel. Uh, so we use the layer-by-layer uh, layer approach. So replace the tube by layers and the concrete core by layers, and you can see that the tube, we treat it as uh, many, many, if you will, uh, bars, if you will, uh, discrete, sort of discretized into many uh, layers, and that could be programmed in a computer, um, and then to get accuracy. So that is the uh, idealized, uh, that the real section, and that's the idealization, and that's the pre-stressing steel. Uh, uh, now, this is the uh, case where the neutral axis is outside. We use the concept of equilibrium, strain compatibility, and material properties to get uh, the stresses and the strains, stresses, and then the resultant forces uh, here. And the equilibrium should be satisfied. Uh, in the case, that's the neutral axis outside, as I said. Uh, for a given, uh, you know, so it's trial and error process using the uh, equilibrium and strain compatibility approach that many of us are familiar with, uh, and then we get the curvature and integrate curvature to get the flexion. The second case is when neutral axis is inside the cross section, and uh, we have compression and tension sides, uh, again strains, stresses, and uh, the f uh, resultant forces, uh, the concept of equilibrium and strain compatibility, of course the effect of pre-strain uh, in the steel is accounted for the pre-stressing effect. We can also build the bending moment and axial load interaction curve in case you have an axial load, like piles and columns have axial load as well, of course, so we can build the interaction diagram as well. Uh, so in terms of prediction, that's one of the cases here, that load deflection curves for the envelope, uh, for the, with, with some of the cycles that we have done, of one of the cases. So here is the predictions. The green curve, is intended to show the model when you completely ignore concrete confinement. So when you ignore concrete confinement, you can see that we are underestimating the behavior significantly. The red curve is when we have account for, the, the, sorry, the, the black and red curve is when we account for confinement. So we certainly get closer to the experimental. The difference is uh, that the red curve is when I use the coupons, stress strain curve of the tube from the coupons, whereas the black curve is when I use the stress strain curve of the tube from the classical lamination theory uh, rather than the tube on uh, tension test stress strain curve. So the model works quite well here. Uh, with the strains, same thing, the top strain compression, bottom strain tension, uh, the same thing. Uh, the best, uh, the best uh, prediction is when you account for confinement and use the tube on stress strain curve, which is the red curve in this case. Um, that's the same thing. Uh, we also, here is a strain in the steel. You can see the steel has pre-strain and it's, you can see the offset, and that's that steel strand strain. The red curve is the best prediction for the steel strand strain. Uh, strand strain, And that's the neutral axis dips. We can predict the neutral axis dips versus moment as well uh, with this model. We did a parametric study to expand the model to certain parameters beyond the limitation of the experimental work to vary the thickness, the pre-stress effect, and the number of strands, and the, uh, also to compare pre-stressing steel strands to carbon fiber, high strength carbon fi fibers pre-stressing strands as well. So for the tube, if you, uh, we varied the ratio of fiber axial to hoop from 3 to 1 to 1 to 3. That's the ratio of hoop to axial fibers, and that's the stress strain curve of the tube in tension and compression for different ratio of axial to hoop fibers. We also, that's, now, based on these different ratios, the more fibers you put in the hoop direction, meaning more confinement for concrete, so the stress strain curve for concrete will vary, of course, from the confinement model by Fan and Riscala. So here you see, now, the green curve, that's the predicted uh, moment uh, curvature. Uh, this is, the green curve is a tube that is heavy in the hoop direction versus axial, whereas the red one is heavy in the axial versus hoop, the blue one is ratio 1 to 1. Again, all this for the same thickness of 6 millimeters, just playing with the ratio of fibers. Of course, the higher the longitudinal uh, proportion of fibers, the higher the strength sensitiveness. 
Um, this is the effect of tube thickness, 2 millimeter tube to 10 millimeter tube, big difference in uh, gains. The tube is very important parameter here. Um, again, that's the effect of the effective pre-stress. It doesn't affect, the effective pre-stress uh, doesn't affect much the ultimate capacity, but it does affect the stiffness after cracking. The green curve is completely non-pre-stressed, meaning you just put the steel strands there, which is not practical, but just for the sake of comparison. And that is the effect of number of steel strands, from four strands to eight steel strands. It's actually not as effective as a tube. Uh, adding, increasing the number of steel strands. And that is comparing carbon pre-stressing to steel pre-stressing. Uh, that's carbon tendons. Uh, but it's not just five. Carbon is perhaps maybe more expensive in this case, but uh, uh, since the tube will protect the system from corrosion, uh, there is nothing wrong uh, with using the steel strands, uh, and they should be last longer. So this is just a theoretical exercise in this case. This is the interaction curve, axial load bending moment interaction curve. Uh, the red curve is a tube with more fibers in the uh, axial direction. In this case, you get higher flexural capacity but lower confinement effect. Whereas the blue curve uh, is the tube with more fibers in the hoop direction. So you get more confinement and higher axial load and less bending. That's the same one. So in conclusions, we can say that flexural response of pre-stressed uh, uh, concrete field tubes is non-linear and exhibits uh, a ascending trend. The conventional uh, pre-cast member shows plastic response rather than ascending response with significantly lower ultimate capacity. Initial stiffness and cracking strength of pre-stressed system is higher than that of non-pre-stressed concrete field tube system. After yielding of the strand, the stiffness becomes the same. The confinement effect of concrete in compression zone is enhanced by pre-stressing. For high pre-stress level, this confinement is close or similar to a pure column or a pure axial load. The uh, proposed analytical model predicts the flexural response quite well, uh, and the confined concrete and FR, uh, uh, using the confined concrete and FRP coupon test. I must also say that mention here that this particular model it was published in the uh, ASCE Journal of Structural Engineering, and in fact received the uh, best paper award, the TYLN, the uh, that's the uh, TYLN best paper award from American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, the uh, next is the first life failure. Uh, I, I didn't have a chance to speak about this, but this has to do with the progressive failure of the tube itself. Uh, we can skip this because of the interest of time. Uh, the in increasing tube thickness and the percentage of longitudinal fibers are more effective than increasing the number of steel strands in enhancing flexural capacity. Carbon fiber uh, pre-stressing uh, bars may not be justified justified in this case because they are much more expensive than steel, but at the same time that tube is sufficient to protect the steel from corrosion, uh, and that's basically what we have at this point. So this, I must acknowledge these uh, parties, and uh, thank you, that is for the first presentation. I hope I can quickly go through the second presentation. Um, uh, I will just see if there is any uh, comments at this point. So I try to go through the second presentation very quickly. Um, so the second presentation has to do with pre-stressing uh, concrete bridge girders. They are ash to girders specifically, uh, pre-stressed with carbon FRP uh, tendons and carbon fiber stirrups as well. And that is one of the early things work we do we did in the mid 90s in fact uh, and built the first bridge in the world with this kind of technology in Manitoba Canada so I'll see here if I can uh, so I'll skip this and we'll go straight forward to the proposed bridge so in the province of Manitoba in Canada we wanted to build a, a bridge with a hundred foot span uh, simply supported ash to girders uh, quite deep uh, uh, over six feet deep the girders, and uh, that's the kind of configuration they thought about for that particular bridge, uh, and pre-stressed with steel strands and steel stirrups, and I, you see here they have this particular configuration which is not the best, but that's for the ease of fabrication they had this 
uh, kind which, in my opinion, it was a weakness and later was corrected, this kind of uh, configuration. So that is the bridge that was proposed at that time. Uh, it's a five-span bridge covered by uh, 40 ash girders. All girders were precast, simply supported. Each girder had 40 steel strands of half inch, 40 half inch strands. 16 out of the 40 are uh, harped, uh, not draped, harped at an angle of 4 degrees. Uh, the stirrups were 16 millimeters uh, diameter and spaced at uh, 400 millimeters. The jacking stress was 75 percent of the ultimate stress. So, uh, so we wanted to replace the steel by carbon. So we started to design model beams. So we modeled this system. Uh, we using a scale to uh, experimental work. Uh, the scale was one to three point six, and they uh, adapted the scale. So we tried to be as accurate as we can with modeling. So the stand to depth ratio was seventeen point eight. Jacking stress was sixty percent of the guaranteed strength of the carbon fiber. Now. The carbon fiber we use two types which are significantly stronger, significantly stronger than the uh, high strength steel, uh, the, the 270 KSI steel, uh, pre-stressing steel. In this case, the first type was 2150 MPa, the second one was almost 3000 MPa. So the same stress at the we we so we maintained in the model beam same stress at the CG of the section exact due to pre-stressing exactly like the real bridge. And we designed it for the same flexural uh, failure mode uh, and uh, different strain levels to be in. The idea was to have different stirrups, a uh, variety of stirrups to see the effect of various stirrups uh, uh, diameter and configuration. So these are the beams, six beams. The first uh, uh, three beams here were pre-stressed by uh, the uh, carbon fiber tendon, the first type with reinforcement ratio of 1%. The difference was the stirrups. So we had a 7.5 millimeter diameter, seven wires, seven wires stirrups, uh, five millimeter diameter uh, here, seven wire stirrups as well, and five millimeter solid rather than seven wires, a single wire. So the reinforcement, the stirrups or web reinforcement ratio 0.789 ranging to 0.262. For the second type of carbon fibers, we had two beams um, uh, and uh, with, with, with uh, the same pre-stressing level that we had reinforcement ratio slightly less than this, about 0.858, and two different stirrups, uh, two leg stirrups and one leg stirrups, so 1% and 0.5% web reinforcement ratio. The last beam was exact identical model of the real uh, uh, prototype. And it was steel, a con control specimen with pre-stressing steel and steel stirrups. Uh, and this is the uh, pre-stressing and reinforcement ratio. And that is a picture or a schematic of the beam. The beam was 9.3 meters. Uh, so it's a bit over 30 feet, uh, a bit over 30 feet. And it looks exactly like the, as close as possible to the bridge, uh, the, the full scale uh, bridge. And that's the, that's the model beams. And we even uh, simulated exactly the, uh, the, uh, the real bridge in terms of the ratio of harped versus straight tendons and the stirrups exactly in the end block and uh, close the links like the real bridge. And I must say, this was the first time ever pre-stressing was carbon uh, tendons, pre-stressing strands or bars were harped at an angle. This was the first of its kind application to attempt to, 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 to harp these carbon uh, tendons at an angle and was the first ever application for stirrups in bridges. This is the cross-section of the uh, test beams for the two-legged stirrups and the single-legged stirrups, the first type of carbon and the second type of carbon pre-stress. These are pictures of the stirrups. You can see the two legs and single legs. The rectangle was used for the end block, solid end block. For pre-stressing, this is the pre-stressing system used uh, in the, in the, in the, in the pre-test plant. You can see that you have a hold down and hold up here, but because the abutments cannot, uh, you cannot jack carbon tendons in the uh, uh, conventional precast plants. So we had a special coupler that connects steel strands to the carbon fiber, and then you can pull the steel, and then you transfer the force to the carbon. So this is the uh, before closing the form. You see the carbon stirrups 
and you see the pin, this pin here is the hole down and you see the carbon strands coming up getting ready for the pre-stressing and the assembly of the stirrups and the end blocks. You see the carbon uh, strands, some are straight, some are at an angle. Here is the coupler. You see this coupler uh, connecting the carbon to steel, seven wire strand steel. Interestingly, as uh, I'm sure you know, when you pull pre-stressing steel, it actually uh, twists. And as it twists, it that rotation uh, could induce uh, torsional stresses on the carbon, which is not a good idea. So we have a yoke here to prevent the coupler from rotation. This is the beam, and uh, after you know releasing the form and the precast beam, and even the stirrups, carbon stirrups sticking out to connect to the composite deck, because we wanted to simulate exactly what you would do in real life. And these are the pins in this case holding these strands hold down. Uh, now I must say something here. As you know, when when you scale down dimensions, the stresses do not scale down with the same ratio. Uh, so it's not a linear. Uh, so for, for example, the, the stresses in the full scale beam due to self weight will be completely different in, if you scale down the dimensions from the stresses due to self weight of a small beam. It will be here much less. So to compensate for this effect and in order to maintain the, the, the exact level of stresses as in uh, top fiber, bottom fiber, uh, uh, in the re uh, due to pre-stress in the model beams, we added temporarily, temporarily post-tensioning at top here to compensate for the lack of uh, linear uh, sort of uh, proportional of the self-weight stresses. And I'll show you that this was removed at a certain point. This is the uh, the, 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 the beams after being pre-stressed, then we took it out and then we cast the concrete deck, a uh, portion of the concrete deck on top of this system. And this is the temporary post-tensioning, as I mentioned earlier. Then we took the beams into the lab and tested them under four loads, kind of simulation of a four-axle truck uh, in this case, and as you can see here. And that is a picture of the beams. It's very old and not quite uh, high-quality picture, but you can get the point. It's a mine point, something meter long beam, and the 4.4 loads applied uh, symmetrically on the beam. Then. Once we apply the machine load to a certain level that simulates the difference in self-weight effect that was calculated uh, uh, from the machine applying the load, we remove that extra pre-stressing because it was no longer needed. So we remove, we cut that pre-stress uh, because it's unnecessary at this point. And we continue the test. So we instrumented the beams <coughs> in a variety of ways. Here you can see the uh, shear uh, uh, stations for measuring shear strains and so forth. Now, this is the results. Uh, the load deflection curve, you can see here the load deflection curve. Uh, this, uh, the red curve is the one conventional with steel strand, the control one. And the, those three is the first type of carbon, CFCC carbon fibers. So this is, a, you can see, a linear. So this carbon fiber is linear material. It does not yield. So beyond cracking, you see similar kind of similar stiffness until you reach this point and then you rupture the carbon. There is no yielding in that carbon. Uh, uh, but it's obviously stronger than the steel. For the second carbon, you see it's a stronger carbon fiber, so you can see that again it goes linearly, and then here you have tension failure of the carbon, so you don't get that kind of ductility, but if you look at the energy under the, the level of energy measured by the area under the curve, it's quite comparable for both pipes, but certainly much stronger. There is something, there are certain things happened with regard to the stirrups here, we can talk about it, um, I think I'll skip this for the interest of time, but uh, this is the stirrup, uh, this is the load, shear load, the reaction, versus the stirrup strain. One, this is the beginning of diagonal cracking, shear cracking, and that is a stirrup strain levels here, uh, depending on the amount. If you have small stirrups, then you have less, you have high strain. Uh, if you have more stirrups, heavier, bigger stirrups, you have less shear strain or the stirrup strain. This is the crack width. We measure the crack width, diagonal crack width, uh, again, for the effect of the stirrups. AV is the uh, web reinforcement ratio as the load increases. So the first cracking here happens, and then the crack width uh, goes up to 1.2 millimeters, and then until failure happens. Uh, this is the, uh, again, the port. This is the V minus V cracking. So this is only the post-cracking behavior uh, for two different types, the steel versus carbon. So this is a steel stirrup, the purple and the yellow is a carbon stirrup, as you can see. Comparable kind of strains uh, beyond the first 
uh, diagonal crack. This is the cracks, uh, shear cracks in the girders with the carbon stirrups and the carbon uh, strands. This is failure of one of the beams. You can see that the tension failure and uh, significant cracking. And here you see that uh, after failure, it's interesting. This is the carbon. So this is carbon stirrups and carbon fiber pre-stressing tender strands. Uh, you see an rupture here. You see that some of the wires have fractured of the carbon, and that is after we cut it and have a look at the cross section. So in conclusion, uh, the flexural behavior of beams pre-stressed by carbon fiber tendons showed similar stiffness to that of the beams pre-stressed by steel strands uh, up to the yielding of the steel strands. Uh, Harping the carbon fiber tendons is practical. We managed to get this at 4 degrees uh, and does not influence the flexural capacity. Uh, it may attract the location of failure, though, at that stress concentration location. Uh, we did not see any slip between the concrete deck or the slab and the girders. Uh, that means that the combination of the concrete interlock, uh, aggregate interlock, roughened concrete surface, and the carbon stirrups was sufficient to transfer that horizontal stresses. Uh, the uh, change in elastic modulus between steel and carbon uh, had insignificant effect. We did not see a big difference in terms of the stirrups strain or the diagonal crack widths. Also, the effect of the uh, web reinforcement ratio on stress level in stirrups and the diagonal crack width was not directly proportional to the web reinforcement ratio. So, uh, if you double, meaning if you dub, if you cut the stirrups by half, it's not that you're going to get double the uh, crack width necessarily. That was the conclusion we saw here. So, I think with this, this concludes. The, I must also mention that following these tests, immediately these results were used to build the bridge. And the bridge is uh, uh, built in, it's called the Taylor Bridge in Manitoba, uh, Headingley, Manitoba, Canada. Uh, and is, as I said, 100 feet long girders, all with carbon fibers and the uh, stirrups as well. And is performing extremely uh, well. And in fact, it is monitored uh, till now. So with this, I, I, I think I'm done with my presentation, uh, my two presentations. And I'll be happy to 